Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We're about to start our webinar. So welcome to the sales conversation. Another journey into urgency based selling. Bold vision, bold behavior. Today's theme is I, have, I don't sell. I have relationships. I don't sell. Who will benefit um, from watching this program? Primarily for salespeople and sales leadership, but also for CEOs, presidents, and owners to get a greater understanding of selling. Now, this seminar was largely um, inspired by a recent client that's been in business 100 years. I met the CEO, he liked what I had to say, and he referred me to the VP of sales. The VP of sales said, it's 100 years, over 100 years. We know we sell everyone. We, we don't need selling. Why would we need selling? So that's kind of like the, the motivation for this webinar. Why indeed? Well, that's what we'll be talking about today. And if you have some questions, We'll put a, a five, 10 minutes aside at the end to field your questions. Key points we're gonna to explore today. What is a strong business relationship? How do you measure it? What outcomes should a strong business relationship provide? Now, is it really either or? Like either you have strong relationships or you do selling and persuasion to open new accounts, to defend your existing accounts, and to sell change. Is it an either or? In the book Built to Last, that's called a tyranny of the or, a false alternative, and great companies overcome the tyranny of the or with an and. And we're gonna talk about why you want an and. And in effect, if you use proper selling skills, you'll have more great relationships. Now, what we prefer in sales, if you have a sales position, of course, is warm introductions, particularly, you know, Glengarry leads. And these result in new strong relationships. You get them frequently and easily. And we wind up with customers who support our initiatives, ask for our initiatives, you know, like to buy our new products. But this isn't always so easy in real life, and we should prepare for the black swan problem. Let me give you an example. A salesperson who earned $500,000 plus a year from selling one customer. I work with this client for about, I don't know, a year and a quarter or more. And the owner told me he kept on coaching this salesperson. His name was Joe. Said, Joe, get other clients. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. He said, no, I got a great relationship here. There are no problems. Well, he did have a great relationship. But the, the client, a Fortune 100 company, decided to bring in a buying consulting organization to drive down costs. And they so drove down costs, they wanted to buy from Joe, but we couldn't make any money. So in the period of six months, Joe's income went from a half a million dollars a year to $50,000 a year. And he, he went to the owner and said, look, I took care of you. I bought in business during the good years. You have to take care of me now and keep on paying me a half a million dollars, even though I'm not bringing in business. Well, as you can imagine, the owner couldn't do that and Joe left the business. Here's another example. I had a, um, a business where I sold into a market and I have like a 10 year run where it looked like recurring revenue evergreen into the future. Um, I mean, there was one part of my brain that said this is the last year, but it just kept on going year after year. And then finally, it was the last year. Now, I had great relationships with all my customers, but the problem was one of my customers decided to go into self manufacture. They made the product I was selling a container they became the low cost producer in the industry and drove everybody else out of business. So I still had great relationships with the people who no longer wanted or needed my product. 
And then on the deepest level, there's product life cycles. You know, products come to the end of their cycle. There's innovation, there's competition, there's new demand. So it's really helpful to always have um, new, new relationships percolating. And that's why you have to use your magic moment of access. It's so important when you have strong relationships. So what do you do in the magic moment of access? And what is this magic moment? Well, you've met your, your you know, big fans needs, great relationship. You confirm they're delighted. There are no further needs. And now you have a magic moment of access to do something special. Now, what I've observed most salespeople do at this moment is, you know, they, they're in project management mode and they run on to the next assignment. Like they confirm that the client is happy. They got the shipment. They got the quote. They got the blueprint. They got the sample. And they don't think that there's a magic moment of access. You could do something right now. Like, what can you do? Well, let's say your 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 client, great relationship. They're not buying everything that you offer. You're pigeonholed. You could break the pigeonhole. You could ask them to buy another product. You could ask for an introduction. If it's a big corporation, maybe you could be introduced to another division. If not, perhaps you could be introduced to a non-competing colleague that they may know from trade shows that's not in the in 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 the organization. It's important to ask for introductions where you have great relationships because our big fans, great relationships are the super highway to the future, to success, to survival. Consider for instance, Sally's story. I was working with a company, there were 15 salespeople. They did about 35 million in sales altogether and Sally controlled half of the sales. She was dealing with a fortune 100 company. And um, the whole group, we had the assignment, magic moment of access, we're gonna get a warm introduction. Now we have a one-to-one -one a couple of weeks later and I asked Sally, how did it go? Did you get any warm introductions? Sally says, no. I said, okay, how many people did you ask? She said, nobody. I said, you didn't ask anyone? Didn't you know we all had an assignment? Yeah, I know. Well, what happened, Sally? She said, Andy, you don't understand. When I was hired 22 years ago, my job was to wait to the phone ring. When the phone rings, I go over to the client, find out their needs, work with the factory to get it. And then I drive back and I, I, I sit and I wait for my phone to ring. That's my job. I said, I got it, Sally. Here's the problem. You're blocking the superhighway. We never know when a black swan event is going to occur. And you're only selling like two divisions out of 80. So if you don't ask for warm introductions where you have this great relationship, we gotta get somebody else to do it. Well, this is a happy ending, this story, because two weeks later in the one-to-one, -one, Sally had a warm introduction. So a takeaway for you here is with your big fans where you have great relationships, are you asking for introductions or something else in the magic moment of access? Because this, this is one of your strongest selling assets are your great fans. So when we earn a trusted advisor relationship of respect, that's a hard thing to do, right? At the outset, like if we're trying to close an account or develop a relationship, it could be like kicking a ball uphill where on a canted or, or slanted soccer field where the competition's the incumbent, they own the relationship and they're rolling the ball downhill and we're like trying to kick the ball uphill. Well, if we do our job, we've leveled the playing field and now we have a relationship. What we're gonna explore next is now that you have a great relationship, how do you make, sense, uh, make use of the relationship? Well, maybe it's really true that you don't need to open new customers. Like this company I mentioned that's in business for a hundred years and they know and they sell everybody, right? The CEO referred me to the VP of sales. We don't need to sell, we sell everybody, right? Well, there's no need for selling if you define it as opening new customers. How about another definition? So what's our biggest challenge that makes it feel like we're rolling a stone uphill and it's coming down on back on top of us? Maybe it's selling change. Do we even believe change is possible in these great relationships? So if we define for this 100 year old company, maybe for you, if you define selling as opening new customers, forget it, you don't want that. But how about selling new items to existing customers? 
getting a sh greater share of business from existing customers, like if you're splitting it 50-50 with a competitor. Could we go to 75-25? Remember the magic moment of access. Are you getting warm introductions? Maybe we need a price increase. Are you implementing changes in a program? Maybe there's a new marketing support program or longer lead times. See, the underlying issue here is conflict. You may have a great relationship, but is there any conflict and how are you managing the conflict? Because the prospect may not want to change if you want to sell new items or get warm introductions. So to change, we often need to overcome self-limiting assumptions. Here's a classic case of a self-limiting assumption that was overcome. That we, as humans, we can't run a four minute mile. Bannister was the first person to run the four minute mile when it was thought to be impossible. So the day before he did it, everybody thought it was impossible. Our hearts, our sinews, our lungs. We're not designed as humans to run a four minute mile. You know, in the year after he ran the four minute mile, somebody beat his time. Somebody just a little bit because they believed it. So if we don't believe change is possible, it probably won't happen. So within this great relationship, we typically need to sell change. Do you know the conditions for change if you have a great relationship? Under what circumstances will your great relationship, your big fan, um, entertain change? What are the conditions? So if you really have a great relationship, one of the things you should know is, what do they need to have? What are the glasses you need to fill to make a change, for instance, to sell them a new item. So that's another takeaway point for you. Do you know the conditions for change? Is your culture right within your company for change? You know, we distinguish between people who are social sellers or managers of accounts who say, hey, I want you to be my friend versus business sellers who wanna earn the right to profitable business. Well, is it one or the other? That's the tyranny of the or, because what you need is an and. You both want to have a good social relationship, but you also want to have a business relationship. In my experience, the social sellers don't do enough of the business. And when the social selling dominates and the business selling becomes very little, and remember that includes managing conflict. When social values dominate and we don't manage conflict, we usually don't get our objectives, even though we have a great relationship in one area. That's why we need bold vision, bold behavior, core to urgency-based selling. Now I have found, I've been doing this for 30 years, I've worked with over 170 companies. I have found self-image is a big problem. Too many people see selling in a negative way, looking at, for instance, death of a salesman, where the anti-hero, Willie Loman, He's a slimy loser. He cheats on his wife. And in the end, he's miserable and he commits suicide. You know, a lot of salespeople internalize that view of selling. So they never, they never um, embrace conflict and do what they can do within the context of a great relationship. By contrast, I offer you my view of the salesperson as a hero. I use as my source material Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces. Campbell was an anthropologist who studied hero myths in hundreds of years, in hundreds of cultures over thousands of years. And he kind of defined the quest of the hero. Let's look at a classic myth and see, can we apply it to selling, even within the context of great relationships? So in a classic myth, this is make believe. That was a long time ago, a thousand years, 10,000 years ago. Everything's cool, and then a fire-breathing dragon moves into the neighborhood, you know, it's a myth, and starts killing cattle and then killing people. And eventually, the queen, the king, the, the mayor, the vizier, calls all the townspeople together in the center of town and makes an announcement. Somebody's got to do something about this fire-breathing dragon. Um, if you go out there, you kill him, cut off the head, bring it back as evidence, uh, you get half my kingdom. You know, and you can marry my son or daughter if you're the marrying type. This is a, a kind of a classic setup. And if we could look at those townspeople, most of them, their their heads are downcast. They're shuffling their feet. They're ashamed. They don't want to do it. But in these in these myths, one person says, "I'll go," 
And this man or woman has all kinds of adventures. They meet friends and foes, but there are worthy heroes. You know what happens? They get magical gifts, like they have the cloak of invisibility or the shield of, invis of invulnerability or the sword of invincibility. And eventually they're ready to face the dragon. They slay it, cut off the head, bring it back to civilization. And the essential question is at what point of the journey do they become a hero? Many people think it's when you come back and celebrate and get the reward, but in culture after culture, um, Campbell has shown it's when somebody volunteers to face adversity. Now, we don't face fire-breathing dragons today. We face dragons of the mind, and that's the adversity that we face in selling when we, had, when we embrace conflict. We face ignorance. We face, we face complacency. These are all dragons of the mind. We face lazy people, but perhaps more than anything else, we face the closed mind. And what makes us heroes, in my view, is that salespeople open the closed mind, even within a great relationship. And opening the closed mind is what moves civilization forward. So salespeople are heroes. Now, what arms us in this quest? The prospect is on a false summit. He or she is on that summit, they're looking down, and the, the essential act of selling persuasion is we get them to look up and see there's a higher peak of well-being out there. That's the essence of persuasion, whether we're opening a new account or we're trying to improve an existing customer's well-being. It's how we earn the right to access, it gives us moral certainty. Another key element besides having a vision of how we help clients is level five leadership. A level five leader, we all need to be level five leaders. A level five leader is both highly competent and humble. Wait a second, Andy, isn't it either highly competent or humble? Well, that's what Colin and Porus would call a tyranny of the oar. It's both. And Collins in Good to Great gives this wonderful metaphor of the window in the mirror for level five leadership. When things go well, you look outside the window, you give credit to the team. When things don't go well, you hold the mirror up to your face and say, what could I have done differently? What could I have done better? Take total ownership. In a dysfunctional team, in a dysfunctional uh, uh, leader or salesperson, they reverse the roles. When things go well, they look at the mirror, they pat themselves on the back and say, wow, I'm really good. And when things don't go well, they look outside the window and say, who could I blame? This is how we get to the CEO's perspective or the owner's perspective, by using the window and the mirror properly. The window is the opposite of learned helplessness. Nobody wants to hear, there was nothing I could do, the, the, you know, it was the price, it was inventory. So the key here is we have to understand at each step, we earn the right and ideally with bold vision, bold behavior. Let's look at the buyer's perspective for a moment, even in a great relationship. Have we explained to the buyer why the change is good for their organization? What proving have we done? Did we use our great relationship, if there's only with the buyer, to build C-suite contacts? Have we helped our key contacts sell the rest of the organization? How have we made it easy for the buyer? We have a document we call the one pager to help our key decision maker sell the rest of the organization. Are you, here's another takeaway. Are you doing a grid relationship analysis? Green, great, yellow, some, red, none. Let's say you have three customers, ABC, DEF, GHI. You say you have a great relationship with all of them. Now, ideally, we have a relationship with the CEO, the COO, the CFO, and the functional DM, the buyer. Fill out the grid. Hey, take a look at this one over here. You see that red? There's probably a vulnerability. If somebody goes into that great relationship and they go in at the CEO level, we might just lose our business. So one of the most important jobs you have when you have a great relationship is to fill out this grid and make sure we have green all around. There's lots of selling to be done. Here's another thought. It's a salesperson's job to make sure there's uncontested space within that great relationship. This idea is um, emphasized in the book Blue Ocean Strategy, which differentiates between red ink, which means that um, uh, red oceans or red ink, cutthroat competition,
tranquil waters of blueing of uh, tranquil blue waters of uncontested space. It's our job in sales to help determine what will be uncontested space so that we in effect don't have competition. It's part of a salesperson's job. So here's a little exercise you might bring back to your team. Power of the wisdom in the room. How do you create a blue ocean of uncontested space? You know, when we do a program, we do not ending, you know, wisdom in the room exercises. Here's one that you might try. When you have a great relationship, you have to verify you've made the three sales. Now, the most important sale is the salesperson's sale. So if you're in there and you're accepted, that's fantastic. But have you effectively made the offer sale and the company sale? The company sale is the risk mitigating sale. And in my experience, this is often one of the weakest part of our selling efforts is we haven't sold the company in. One way to do that is to establish point to point connections. For instance, our shipping department, their shipping department, et cetera. Now, an essential tool to manage change is your standard sales call. If you want to see a one minute video on the standard sales call, write to me after the webinar. I'll send you the link to it. There are three parts to your standard sales call. One to seven is setting it up. Eight to 12 is your fact finding. 13 to 18 is managing the change process. I'll just highlight three points here for you. How you earn the right to the change process when you have a great relationship. You start with your wisdom, your freebie, the non-self-serving offer. Here's what I'm giving you. You don't have to buy from me. Hopefully that sets up the self-serving offer. Here's how I could help you, but it also helps me. And when we do this well, we get to urgency and action. So can we ever have enough of these great relationships? Probably not, but if we don't get warm introductions, and if we, if we don't wanna be susceptible to black swan events, what is left for us? Very hard selling. So if you don't have a relationship, and if you're not getting warm Glengarry leads, and if you're not asking for warm introductions, this is what you face. A prospect may ignore you or be hostile. And they're saying, I'm good, and we have to pierce the veneer of I'm good, and very often they're drowning, and we have to save them. This is really hard stuff to do if we don't manage our great relationships well. Well, then you finally connect. The buyer says they're busy. Why? Because they don't know what they don't know. They don't know. It's so hard to get the message across, the type three knowledge. But when they finally know, that's when you have another great new relationship. That's how we start another new relationship. What did we cover today? Selling doesn't stop when we have great relationships. It probably takes a different form. Our underlying challenge is managing conflict and having the courage to confront. When we have a great relationship, can we get valuable introductions and testimonials? Can we increase our share of business if we don't have all of it? Can we upsell? and cross sell our line? Can we sell changes in our offer? Can we fill out the relationship grid and make sure we have green in all the key boxes? Can we ensure that we have uncontested space on an ongoing basis? Wow, there may be more selling to do when there is a relationship than when there isn't a relationship. Well, Rome wasn't built in a day, and so we're almost at the end of today's webinar. I wanna thank you again for calling, uh, I mean, joining us. Um, in a minute, we're gonna have some time for questions if you have any questions. Uh, you might wanna think about your takeaways. If you have any questions that occur to you afterwards or you don't wanna ask now, you could write to me at andyg at urgencybaseselling.net. Um, in our next month, August 21st, our next webinar is your two-minute drill to rally month-end sales. This is for folks who have to hit a budget and they're not quite there. The whole seminar is about how do you hit your monthly budget. And so now we have some time for questions. We have about five or 10 minutes. Um, if you want the spreadsheet, the actual spreadsheet with the relationship grid, send me an email. If you want a link to our webinar, how to defend your key customers for competition, again, an email. And for leaders, I offer a 30 minute free consult. Um, if you'd like to reach out to me at this email address, 
And now let's see if we have any questions. You could use the chat box, of course, if you haven't done that before. Let's see. Relationship grid. Is it really appropriate to get to know a CEO if you're selling kind of an insignificant, low cost item? That's a decent question. Um, it might be the case that it's not appropriate all the time, but I do have uh, one thought to share with you. And I think it comes from one, Malcolm, one of Malcolm Gladwell's uh, books. And New York City, when they had a zero tolerance view of crime, when they would arrest fair beaters, people who were jumping over the turnstiles when you could in those days and not paying the fare to get on the subway, they found the murder rate went down. Because when you watch the small things, people are very sensitive about the big things. And the way I would, I would you know, apply this and, and justify a meeting with a CEO, and it becomes a CEO issue, is you could apply the same thinking there, by which I mean, if we could get the team to look at low cost items, you know they're gonna watch big cost items. Another question here. Isn't introducing conflict the opposite of having a relationship? Shouldn't a customer be willing to do what you recommend if you have a great relationship? Well, I think they will do everything that's defined within that great relationship. But if you wanna do other things, I think you have to uh, sell those things. I don't think you, you automatically get everything you want. I think you get the status quo. So I think they'll continue to support the status quo. I don't like this pushy stuff. I don't like when people are pushy with me. I want to treat people the way I want to be treated. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, I would say to you, we're, we're trying to get people to a higher level of well-being. And I think it's important to keep that vision in mind. And the second thing I would bring to your attention is that I think it's the job in selling to open the closed mind. So if you really don't want to open the closed mind, maybe this isn't the right uh, profession, but I think it's worth a discussion. Is it reasonable for salespeople to have the responsibility of finding a defendable position? Isn't that really high level corporate strategy stuff, high level stuff, CEO, you know, executive VP stuff. I don't know, maybe it is, but this is what I've always taught. In fact, I think it's one of the most important parts of being a, a salesperson is finding and reinforcing a defendable position. Because no matter how great our product is, it, it often needs to be tailored in some certain ways. I'll, I'll give you a for instance. <laughs> Um, when I had another company, I developed a product and um, I brought it to Kmart and it was a toy game kind of a product and the Kmart buyer really liked it and he said to me that if uh, Milton Bradley doesn't make it, he'll, he'll buy it from me. That's what he said. If Milton Bradley doesn't buy it, he'll, he'll buy it from me. So Milton Bradley didn't want to make it because the, um, you know, the, the, the volume was too low for them, so they didn't want to buy it. And the, the, um, but there was a conflict. I was packing the product in six packs and it turned out that the buyer really wanted them. In, uh, I was bought, packing them in 12 packs and the buyer wanted them in six packs, excuse me. So my point is there was a conflict and I had to get the buyer to discuss it. If the buyer never discussed the conflict between how I packed 12 packs and how he wanted them six packs, I never would have sold him. So, you know, there, there very often is conflict. And, you know, I, I would say it's our job to find the conflict and resolve it. Well, I think that's all we have for today. I got a thank you note from one of the uh, uh, participants that he enjoyed the seminar. So thank you to you for the comment. That's it for today. If you have any questions, write to me at urgencybasedselling.net and we'll look forward to seeing you um, next month with our seminar, your two-minute drill to or rally to hit month-end sales. Thanks again for meeting with us. Look forward to seeing you again next month. Bye now.